Montana Ag Live is made possible by the Montana Department of Agriculture, MSU Extension, the MSU Ag Experiment Stations of the College of Agriculture, the Montana Wheat and Barley Committee, Cashman Nursery and Landscaping, the Northern Pulse Growers Association, and the Gallatin Gardeners Club. Welcome to Montana Ag Live, coming from to you from the studios of KUSM on the vibrant campus of Montana State University. I'm Tim Seipel. I'm sitting in the captain's chair tonight. We have organized a great group of panelists for everyone, so please submit those questions about your lawns, your garden, your farm, weeds, soil health, um, rodents, and, um, and preparing for winter. So tonight, we have a great group of panelists organized here, and I'll go through and introduce them, and we'll come back to Susan, and she'll tell us about wind erosion in Montana. So first, on the far side down there, we have Bruce Maxwell, Agri Professor of Agricultural Ecology at MSU Bozeman. Um, Bruce was on my master's committee when I was a master's <laughs> student. Next to Bruce, we have Susan Tolman. She's an NRCS um, agronomist and certified agronomist as well. Um, and she's going to talk about wind erosion. Mm -hmm. Next to Susan, we have Stephen Van Tassel. He's a vertebrate control specialist for the Montana Department of Agriculture. And so if you have any questions about pesky four-legged uh, vertebrates, call him in. <laughs> and next to me is Abby Saeed. She's the extension horticultural specialist, so call in and ask all those questions about lawns, gardens, and everything else. We have some great show and tell we'll come back to tonight, but our topic that we're going to cover tonight as our special guest, Susan, is you're going to tell us about wind erosion in Montana. You know, November to March is Chinook season. It's, we know it's coming up, and, and you're going to tell us about the status of wind erosion in Montana. I thought it was solved when we switched to no-till, but you're going to fill us in. Oh, great. Thanks, Tim, mm -hmm. and thanks for having me on. This is a topic that um, is important that we talk about in Montana, it's wind erosion. Um, yeah, I think a lot of people had assumed that when we switched to no-till that we wouldn't have problems with wind erosion, but unfortunately that's not the case because um, the key to solving wind erosion is keeping enough residue and vegetation on the field, and that can happen with or without a no-till system. Um, and obviously you can improve your no-till system so you can uh, control for erosion. So that's a real important message I want to get out, is that there are management steps that we can take to control wind erosion. Great. So. It, when I think of wind erosion in Montana, and, and as an extension specialist, I drive around the state, and I'm looking in the, I'm always looking in the ditches to see what color the ditches are, how much soil is in there, and you do during the fall see a lot of soil erosion that's present. Did soil erosion decrease and then increase? Um, what, where does our issues, where does, you know, historically we think of Montana and its strip tillage, you know, we used mm -hmm. to make strips and then leave fallow in between and we kind of broke things up that way. How's, when we switched to no-till, we thought we sort of solved this problem by having, not disturbing the surface as much, but does no-till really function well to prevent soil erosion or how do we think about this when we think about soil erosion? Well, there's been a lot of changes that we've seen across the landscape in Montana uh, the past 20, 30 years. So when I was growing up on the farm in the 80s and 90s, we were still doing uh, the minimum tillage with the long, narrow strips and alternating with fallow. Um, and now that's, that's not the case. People have switched to no-till. Um, and a couple of things have happened with that. We've gotten more diverse rotations, and that's really great. There's a lot of great things that have come into play with the addition of pulses and oil seeds in the rotation. The challenge with those crops is that the residue is just not very durable, and it doesn't last into our big wind erosion season, which is really November to April, but really for Montana, it's March, to, March and April. 
And then the second thing is our field sizes have gotten larger. Um, and so that creates an avalanche effect. If wind erosion starts to get going across the field, those particles start to then exponentially expand. And we've got a video that I brought in of a producer sent in to us. Um, and I'm not sure if, if, we can, if we can bring that up. Um, it's an aerial photo, and you can see this avalanche effect as, there we go. I don't know if you can see this. This was sent in to us by a producer in the triangle. It's an aerial image. I believe Ryan Casillas sent this in to us. Um, and you can see that, that aerial, excuse me, that avalanche effect as a field gets larger, especially if it's larger in that direction that is parallel to the prevailing wind direction, which in Montana is typically east to west. So the broader you make that east to west direction across your field, the more chance you have for that erosion to just avalanche across the field. Great, thanks. So we have a few questions that have come in and I should, so I've failed to mention before, we have Nancy Blake answering the phone here in the studio with us and we have Judge Bruce Lobo answering phones remotely. So please send them your questions so that um, we can get them onto the air and get them answered. We have one that came in for Abby. This is one about aspens, and this also, I do have some of this in my yard as well. I have black spots on my aspen leaves. Is there anything I should spray on that now, or how should I think about those aspen leaves? Yeah, so um, black spots on aspens, there are a couple of, of fungal pathogens that can be pretty kind of um, aesthetically displeasing on our aspen trees. Um, and generally at this time of year, those trees are going to lose their leaves pretty soon, so this is not a recommended time to spray anything, but there is something you can do right now with any of those kind of fungal issues in your plants is as those leaves drop to really take all that debris out and remove it from the landscape and destroy it as a opposed to leaving it there um, so that it can reinfect um, your trees over and over. And generally, fungicide applications aren't recommended for leaf spots like that unless it's a really uh, persistent problem or a really um, uh, important high value tree. Uh, so generally, sanitation practices like that can help reduce that incidence of these leaf spot issues. So I have to admit, I don't have a lot of extra time and I just will let the leaves fall down onto the ground. Is that bad for me? I'm not worried, I, I like the natural disease in my trees and can I just <laughs> leave it in my tree and let it grow on the ground? I mean, it, if, if, if left, like, and it, if it runs rampant, it can eventually lead to the decline in the health of your trees, but in terms of just the lifespan of aspens and landscapes, <laughs> they don't usually live past 15 to 20 years in exactly. most landscapes anyway. So if you like to have just that you know, biological experiment going on in your trees, <laughs> then go for it. I very much do. I have a great stand and they make a lot of young shoots that come up every year. So I don't mow the lawn, I mow the aspens down <laughs> and shoot up out of the ground. Um, great, thanks. So let's see, we have another question that came in, one for Steven. Okay. And that's every bird season, my dog en encounters a skunk. <laughs> Are there any deodorizing products that actually work? Should I bathe my, my dog in tomato juice? No, don't use <laughs> tomato juice. It's uh, actually, the only reason why people think tomato juice works is because of all factory fatigue. How's that for a Jeopardy question? Uh, <laughs> which means your, your nose is so overwhelmed by the skunk odor that it wants to smell something new. That's why people <laughs> think tomato juice works. No, you wanna use one quart of hydrogen peroxide, one cup of baking soda and one tablespoon of liquid dish detergent. Dawn is particularly recommended because of the grease cutting ability. Mix it fresh and then simply, you can wash your dog with it, keep it out of the dog's mouth, keep it out of the dog's eyes, and it actually denatures the skunk essence. Make sure your dog hasn't bitten the skunk or the skunk didn't bite your dog because skunks are a rabies vector species here in Montana. So gloves are certainly, don't let the dog in the house. You're gonna regret that. Uh, so it works very, very well. Just keep those elements fresh. Some people use it in a bucket and just carry it with them when they're going out in the field. Mm. <laughs> Thank you. That's good to know. I do. I did wash my cat once with tomato juice. And that was okay. It didn't work out well. <laughs> so we have a question from Fort Benton. 
And I noticed this when I was in northwest, northwest Montana last weekend. It's much drier in northwest Montana than it is in southwest Montana. So, Jack, if you're watching, I'm going to contradict you a little bit. The northern tier of Montana is in a hard drought. And this person says um, a moderate El Nino condition is predicted for, for the Pacific Ocean this winter. What does that mean for Montana? And what might that mean for our, our weather conditions? So the, the way that works typically is that that, that means we'll have a, uh, um, a drier winter. Mm -hmm. That's on average. It doesn't always work out that way, but, uh, so it's, but it has a very high percentage chance. It's like 70% chance of an El Nino. Mm -hmm. so, and it's been building. Yep. So that, that makes us believe that, that if there's going to be a dry winter, this is probably likely to, to be one. Yep. Now, having said that, we've also had those El Ninos break down fairly rapidly in, in the last few years. And what that means is in the spring, we still have a very, can have a very wet spring and basically make up for that loss mm -hmm. um, in, in, in a fairly big way. So uh, it's not that it's all dire and, and we're going to, to dry up and blow away, but, uh, but we, we may not have the snow cover, so the skiers may not be as happy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good reason to have good stubble on your field, I think, when we go into those conditions. So, Susan, wh what, do, what are NRCS's recommendations going forward to limit soil erosion for maybe just a producer or a county or thinking about how, how to manage soil erosion? If we know this year might be kind of tough, what, you know, it's too late for harvest, but are there any things that people can think about moving into the future to control soil erosion or limit soil erosion in their situations? That's a great question, Tim. And I wanna to get to that, but first I'm wondering if we can maybe show a little bit about the economic loss of soil erosion. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, we can show some, yep. I brought a picture. I'm, I'm all about pictures today. Um, I brought a picture just uh, showing um, a bunch of soil in the ditch and uh, not, Definitely not trying to call anybody out, but uh, I'm wondering if we could show that picture of the soil in the ditch. And this is in uh, northern Montana. I believe this is in Liberty County, and this was taken uh, last year, so April of 2022. And you can see all that sediment in the ditch. You can barely see the fence lines there. And this is off of a 300-acre field. Um, and you can see how sugary that, so that sediment looks in the mm -hmm. ditch. That's because... Um, when wind comes along, what goes up into the atmosphere is the clay, the silt, and the organic matter, the most valuable fertility pieces of the soil, right? Those are lost to the atmosphere. What's left over is the sand. So what you're seeing there in that ditch is the sand. So our, our soils become less fertile and more sandy with the more erosion that they have on them. Um, so even though this is sand, our local staff went out and took a soil sample in the ditch, just the top six inches. We assumed that this field lost about a quarter inch of topsoil off of a 300 acre field. We did calculations based on current fertility costs and I had Clayne Jones check those assumptions. Mm -hmm. We estimated in the ditch that there was about $7,800 that is lying there in the ditch. So and another and that was of nitrogen fertilization, not organic matter or other important exactly. things. Exactly, that was the NPK and S, and there was a lot of potassium in that. Mm. Um, and there's probably more than seventy-eight hundred dollars in that ditch, right? Because yeah. that's what was available in a lab test, mm -hmm. and we don't know what was lost with organic matter, clay, and silt, right? That was up in the atmosphere. We couldn't test that, so. You know, a message that we want to get out before we talk about how do we fix it is we want people to understand that um, there's a reason that you would want to care about that as a farmer, mm -hmm. um, is that that's, if you're losing soil, you're losing money. That's your property blowing away when it blows away. I yeah. mean, it's a big, it's a big thing. Yep. Well, it, we have a, a whole bunch of questions that are coming in, so let's, let's cut to a couple of them. We have a caller from Corvallis, Montana, who had great cauliflower this summer, but they were always full of earwigs. Is there anything you can do to keep the earwigs out? That is tough. So yeah, earwigs, um, they're omnivores usually, mm -hmm. and so they will attack some younger plants usually, and it can be um, a little frustrating to, to deal with them. 
But if they're a persistent problem, um, uh, I wonder if they have any mulches um, in, in their landscape, but mm -hmm. using kind of um, a barrier mulch, like a plastic mulch, can help prevent them from getting from the soil into your plants that can help reduce those populations. So I would recommend trying that. And if you have any kind of debris around, because they like to nest in kind of mm -hmm. um, usually debris and cool, moist places, so like wood mulches and stuff are places where they would proliferate. So um, I would reduce those and then uh, opt for kind of a, a more of a barrier mulch to prevent them from getting onto the plants. Okay. So Abby, my <laughs> grandmother said they got in my ears. <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's definitely um, a, a misnomer. They're, um, you know, people think earwigs and they think that they're going to crawl into your ears and um, they don't actually do that. I've heard some kind of conflicting tales about why they're called earwigs and some people say it's because of the shape of their wings because their wings are kind of ear shaped and some will say because they like those um, kind of moist places to nest in and when people would have those wigs that they'd store in those drawers, they'd also have earwigs in, the, in them. But um, I heard um, an entomology professor say to me that you're just as likely to end up with a grasshopper in your ear as an earwig. So it's, <laughs> okay. it's yeah, I don't it's like that. a so myth busted. Nothing to fear. No, nothing okay. to fear. They're not going to okay. crawl up into your ears. <laughs> okay, I'll take this one. We have a caller from Belgrade is asking whether it is too late to spray for thistles, and that would probably be Canada thistle. And the answer is. Nope, there has not been a frost yet in the Gallatin Valley. Maybe Belgrade got one a day or two ago, a little bit. But it's, pro it's not too late to spray for thistles. I would put on a backpack, put some glyphosate in there, and just walk around and spot spray all those rosettes that are growing on the ground. If you see a stem sticking up with flowers and seeds, just skip that because it's not going to have any effect on it. If you're going to use herbicide, you should go in and spray those rosettes down on the surface because then that herbicide is translocated down below the surface. Um, so no, not quite too late. Um, yep, we actually sprayed some thistle just in the last week or so. Um, so another caller from Missoula, maybe Abby, you and Bruce or anyone who wants to feel this. This is a call from Missoula is asking about some good lawn substitutes which require reduced little or no water. That's a good question. So this is kind of a hot topic lately um, in terms of people interested in alternative types of lawns. Um, Kentucky bluegrass is probably the most common type of lawn we have in our landscapes and that has a lot of high inputs. Water especially it requires in the hot summer months over two inches of water usually a week um, and it also has high um, uh, kind of uh, nutrient input requirements too, but there are kind of alternatives. So if you're looking for more of a lawn-like aesthetic and still want that turf grass in there, fine fescues require less water than Kentucky bluegrass does. Um, and so I would recommend if you want still um, a lawn that um, works in that regard, that's a good one. We have a couple native turf grasses um, like buffalo grass and blue grandma, but those are warm seed Season grasses. So if you're okay, these would be grasses you wouldn't need to irrigate. But if you are okay with your grass being dormant in those, you know, spring and fall months, um, usually when our Kentucky bluegrass is green, if you're okay with the brown lawn at that time and your lawn will green up only in those hot summer months, that could be a good option for you as well. Bruce, do you have additional oh, thoughts? Oh, just put gravel down and paint it green. <laughs> Yeah, do I not mean, so do that. <laughs> I would offer you want, mulch. We want soil health. We want <laughs> stuff to be alive. Yeah. Yeah. And the, like, the gravel gets to way too hot in the summertime compared to Absolutely. the lawn, actually. Uh, and so I would say, like, if you are opting to get rid of vegetation mulches, like organic mulches, like arborist wood chips, that's a really good one. They'll add nutrients slowly back into the soil as well. And you can use, use that as a landscaping strategy. So if you have existing lawn, if you pile it with about um, eight inches of mulch and let it decompose in there, then you can pull that mulch back and plant those um, drought tolerant plants in there and turn your lawn into a landscape bed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, we have a call from Lewistown, your home turf, Stephen. Okay. Caller has an infestation of pack rats. Ooh. They have <laughs> live trapped about a dozen. Whoa. Wow. Any better suggestion on controlling pack rats? 
Yeah, so I would I would ask the first question is are the pack rats getting into a structure? If they're getting into a structure, then obviously hardening the structure to prevent entry is the ideal, right? We, we don't have to trap, kill, poison the pack rat if we can keep it out of the structure where that it is. Otherwise, uh, I would say, why are you cage trapping your pack rat? <laughs> uh, a rat snap trap would be far more efficient in my mind because you're, I hope you're not like moving it somewhere and letting it go. Uh, that's not really the way to go. Uh, the alternative is going to using some rodenticides. There are some rodenticides that are permitted on for pack rat. Typically, they're produced by Leafatech, which is sort of a Rosol product. Always read the label. It'll tell you whether pack rats are listed, and then follow the label on that. So, Stephen, you have a show and tell in front of us. This is bait that you brought. I do. So, and this is not for pack rats, though. Well, uh, no, not necessarily, but it's the just the principle. I want you to focus on formulation because we're getting the cooler season. That means the mice are looking to get into your home. So, those of you that are using rodenticides, basically, rodenticides come in two flavors a block or soft. So, soft has oil in it, and it's very palatable for rodents. The downside is, is that it doesn't last as long. So, if you're dealing with a cabin that you're not going to be frequenting uh, often, then you may want to go with a block bait. Uh, block bait, of course, it has all these edges, allow rodents to chew on it. These are, it can be the same active ingredient, just a different formulation or a different packaging of the rodenticide. So, if you were able to use uh, if you're able to check your bait stations frequently, soft bait is really dynamite stuff. Uh, otherwise, go with the block bait if you're dealing with areas with high moisture, or if you want to take it up a notch, use both. Give Because, you know, we all like variety. Well, rodents like variety, too, so give them a little hard and a little soft, and that way you can see which one they like best. Well, yeah, they may not be able to tell you which one they will be. <laughs> well, because you'll see one get eaten and one get eaten less. So they'll tell you. <laughs> Great. Um, okay, uh, Abby, we have another question about, okay, let's ask, so we have a caller from Anaconda says the new growth on his raspberries is 10 feet high. Mm. Wow. That's impressive. Yeah. That is impressive. Should he trim them to four to six feet when the plants go dormant? Um, so I would recommend that a lot of times if you have just a lot of vegetation that's kind of crowding, it can cause more fungal issues in plants okay. too. Um, so I um, would, it depends on the type of raspberries. So if you have like ever bearing raspberries, if you, if you trim it back, you'll still have, um, you know, fruit. Um, but I would recommend trimming them back to a more manageable height so they're not kind of crossing and, and um, crowding and um, you won't have as many of those pest and disease issues. And do you have to wait until they go dormant or could you trim them right now? In general, I like waiting when plants go dormant just because it reduces the likelihood of introducing any disease issues by you're making an injury, you're making a cut into those plants. So in general, I like to err on the side of caution and wait until they're dormant to do that. Great, thanks. So, Bruce, we have another question. We have a question come in from Haver. How might a traditional wheat farmer best respond to changes that we're seeing due to climate change in Montana and over the last few years? Well, I think the, you know, the, the important thing is that there's no question that we're getting hotter and drier in the mm -hmm. summer. So a lot of that is adjusting your, your cropping system to, to accommodate that. And we've seen generally a shift toward winter wheat has been more successful. Mm -hmm. And so because it's not uh, maturing or not filling its seed in that really hot period that's now starting to creep into June where it used to be in July. Yep. So that's, that's a very important piece. Um, the other thing is, is as Susan would, would indicate, is leave that, uh, keep some mulch on that field. Keep, mm -hmm. keep some, as much of that litter on the field as you mm -hmm. can. That organic matter will help protect that, that soil and maintain it as moist and, and maintain moisture actually in that material. Even some of the coarser material can, can hang on to that that yep. moisture well. So there's a couple of things like that. So keeping it covered with a crop, yep. pretty important. Um, even though it might seem like it's so dry that you're not going to get a crop, 
just keeping it covered is really, really important. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it seems like a lot of people, when they get really high, hot, dry conditions, want to default to going fallow and, and, and fallow with a tool even. <laughs> and that's not, uh, n not preferred at all. I mean, th the long term, there's no long term advantage in that. I think Susan would probably yeah. agree with that. So, um, anything you want to add to that, Susan? To the Yeah, I would say focus on your crop rotation. Mm -hmm. So, when we talk about getting more residue into your, you know, on the field, the, the best way to do that and the, probably the least expensive way to do that is to just make sure that you're growing a high residue crop at least half of the time. Um, so how, what do I mean when I say high residue crop? That would be a small grain. Um, that would be corn that you've harvested for grain. Um, usually a grass that you've harvested for grain is what we're going to say is a high residue crop, anything that has high carbon in it. And then make sure that you're not growing two low residue crops back to back. For example, pea and lentil. We're not going to do pea and lentil, obviously, for disease reasons. But and also make sure that you're not growing, even though we're not recommending fallow, some people are still using fallow, that you wouldn't be growing a low residue crop uh, then following it with fallow. Um, because that just leaves very little residue on the soil surface. And so not only does that residue protect against erosion, it acts as a mulch that helps to trap soil moisture in the ground and reduce evaporative soil moisture loss. So as we get hotter and drier, we need more residue on the soil surface. And NRCS would recommend 60%. You know, back in the day, in, in the 80s, we would say 30%. Mm -hmm. we've, we've changed that now. Um, and I would say you should really strive to maintain 60% cover on the soil if you can. So how does having high residue, leaving high residue, does that affect wheat stem sawfly in the field? Does that promote or does that affect that dynamic that we have in, in Montana? If, I, I worked with some students and, and producers and we looked at you know where the wheat stem sawfly was overwintering and living and, and does that make a difference in how high you cut that stubble? Do some people want to cut it lower because they can cut that wheat stem sawfly off or anything like that? I'm glad you asked and I really wish David Weaver were here right now because <laughs> I've had a lot of conversations with him. But actually um, keeping that tall stubble is actually better for wheat stem sawfly control. Yeah. So. Um, because it's the tall stubble where the parasitoid, the natural predators live. Mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of guys right now are cutting really low at that four to six inches. And that really doesn't leave any of the habitat for the parasitoids. So um, in talking with Dr. Weaver, he would say that many of the things that we recommend for wind erosion control and for soil health are the same exact principles that he would recommend for helping to control wheat stem sawfly. So he's a big fan of stripper header use as well. Oh, great. Yeah, that's yeah. interesting. Good, good. Um, okay, Abby, we have another question for you here, and this is a caller um, from Joliet, and they said their contoniaster hedge was attacked by small slugs this summer. Hmm. They ate the leaves, leaving only the skeleton of the leaf. Will the hedge survive, and how can they prevent this next year? Yeah, that's a good question. And, and when they mention um, slugs, I'm wondering if it might be sawfly larvae that they were seeing. So um, because um, sawfly larvae are really, you know, well-known skeletonizers of leaves and they'll go in to plants in the rose family, their um, rose slug sawfly specifically will um, kind of really defoliate a tree, but if, if you have just um, general garden slugs, um, I haven't seen damage to that scale. But in general, um, a, a few things to kind of do um, to keep an eye on. So maybe take care of this plant a little bit more starting next spring. If you have one kind of period of defoliation, especially if it's late in the season, usually the energy reserves in those plants are enough to get it through um, and it will um, leaf out again the following spring. But in terms of the type of slug, um, I don't want to make a recommendation without knowing what it is. So if they wouldn't mind, if they have taken pictures or if they wouldn't mind giving me a call or sending me an email to talk more about it, maybe we can narrow down what that exact pest was before I make a recommendation on it. Great. And Abby's phone number is up on the screen right now. <laughs> um, let's move on to our... Uh, so 
I have another question. Caller dug up some wild roses. That's probably Rosa Woodsii, most common wo woods rose, most common in Montana, and transplanted them to their garden. They are now getting scraggly. <laughs> Should he trim them back or let them continue growing? That's a good question. So they were transplanted this year? They were transplanted two years okay, ago. Okay, two years ago, and they're starting to get scraggly. Um, <clears throat> Uh, kind of for rejuvenating, it might be a good idea to trim them back and kind of see um, if, if they become that uh, shrubby kind of um, growth habit again. Um, but um, I would say, yeah, it wouldn't hurt to, to trim them back um, to kind of encourage more growth. Usually mm -hmm. when plants are getting um, spindly or leggy and things like that and, and you don't have um, very much kind of foliage filling in, um, if you prune them back a little bit that encourages more of that green leafy growth and, and more kind of um, branching and so that would help fill them out a little bit more so it wouldn't hurt to do that. Yeah and I think woods rose is, is also rhizominous mm -hmm. so I bet if you trimmed them off you could get exactly. some more shoots to come up out of the ground and then you might get some better spread. Absolutely. And it's a really great uh, pollinator plant as well. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's yeah, one which, of my would, favorites. Woods rose evolved with, with a lot of browsing. So yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So that's yeah, it does you know, really you're just well. Helping it out. Yeah. Yep, I think so too. That's um, the pink one, right? <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. It can go pink, yeah, pink to white. Yeah, yeah okay. there's really you can see very this tall and range Yeah, line. sometimes yeah. it'll be this yeah. tall and sometimes it'll yeah, be two to beautiful. three feet tall. Okay. Yep. If any of my students are watching in class, we talked about phenotypic plasticity this week. <laughs> <laughs> and that is the ability of a plant to grow larger and smaller, you know, given conditions, moisture <laughs> availability and things like that. And Woods Rose is one that can really can do that. Very nice. <laughs> that's, that's like a trivia that's answer a right trivia. there. That is a good trivia down. answer. Phenotypic oh. plasticity. <laughs> Steven, we had a caller from Kalispell who asked if they would, you could quickly repeat their recipe for cleaning a dog that's been skunked. Sure. Uh, so it's one quart of hydrogen peroxide, one cup of baking soda, one tablespoon of liquid dish detergent, Dawn is recommended for its grease cutting capabilities. Mix it fresh, never store it because it'll have pressure and it can cause a little uh, cracking of glass or whatever. So just package everything in a bucket, mix it fresh when you need to use it. And keep it out of the eyes and mouth. And okay. remember, it's hydrogen peroxide, so if you do this on clothes, it will bleach clothes or hair. But it'll, you know, that hair is not a big of a problem. <laughs> So Abby, in the spring part, in the spring season of Montana Ag Live, I asked you about controlling coddling moth mm -hmm. on my apple trees mm -hmm. at home, and you told me to wrap the trees, mm -hmm. and I think it did help, but it didn't mm -hmm. get them perfectly clean, but this is still an awesome apple, yep. but if we want to come in and focus on the apple right here, we can see what we have on the inside. Yeah, so you see kind of the, the little galleries um, uh, of the larvae and the frass in there. Um, the coddling moth larvae feed on the seeds um, of those apples. And this time of year, I was glad that you brought this sample in. Um, this time of year is a good time to kind of add more to the cultural control. So other than that wrapping, um, you can do another season of wrapping. Sometimes they have two to three generations. So you're okay, catching I, the stragglers mm -hmm. again. Um, but also as your apples drop to the ground, clean up all that debris again, like sanitation is a really good strategy. So if you keep doing this and keep catching those, those pupating larvae and removing um, these um, any debris that they can then um, attach to and uh, pupate on that's going to reduce their populations over time and then if this if all of your apples are infested and you really kind of want to prevent that next year, I would contact your county extension office in the spring and they can tell you based on the growing degree day model um, when, when the timing of um, spraying for those would be. Mm, okay, thanks. But it's still a delicious it apple is. anyway, even you with can, yeah. coddling moth into the yes, middle. And exactly. luckily they're eating out the core. So we've yeah. had some nice apple exactly. cakes, apple sauce, mm -hmm. apple, apple everything. And extra protein. <laughs> and extra protein. <laughs> <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> 
Um, if you can't eat, uh, beat them, eat them. That's what we <laughs> say for weed management, right? <laughs> um, and it actually, there, there are possibilities. Steven, we have another question for you, okay. and I'm interested in this answer. And these people have a pigeon problem, and the pigeons are becoming too numerous, and they really don't want to kill them. And they're not Perry Miller, so they're not out trying to get him out of the field with a shotgun. Do I have any other options? Sure. Other than, other than exclusion, things like netting, spikes, uh, electric shock. Uh, and the other option is that there's a product called Ovo Control P, which is birth control for pigeons, and so it takes a while for, obviously, because you're just stopping recruitment, uh, but that is another option for you that you simply, you feed it to them, you only do it during the period of time when they're actually gonna be having uh, mating and having young, so for Montana, that's probably sometime between March to probably October, and you basically just feed it to them, and it's like the pill for pigeons so they don't reproduce. And uh, just and over time, the population will decline if you don't want to do exclusion. But exclusion would be number one. But if you don't want to do exclusion and netting or spikes, then you can go into ovo control P. Mm -hmm. so, the, so if I have a big pole barn and I'm storing hay mm -hmm. in it, and I have a bunch of pigeons in the top, I can use that solution to try to reduce the pigeon pressure out of my... My pole barn? Yeah, it would be time. It would take time. It's gonna, so the fastest I've heard it reducing is 50% a year. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have to be patient because pigeons can last a while. I would suggest other means of eliminating your pigeon problem, but if you didn't want to kill them, then that we've obviously limited some of our options there. So I would do exclusion for the barn, you know, drive them out, and then sort of close the barn door, so to speak. But if that's not possible, then I would move into perhaps the oval control P. Okay. Hmm. On the MSU campus, the great horned owls and merlins have done a great job. Ah. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Predation can help. Yeah, they really. Um, Susan, so, so we had some questions come in and producers asked a couple of them. They were asking about, so what can they do to prevent wind erosion? Are there any NRCS programs that they could get involved in or be a part of? And how might that work for producers across the Golden Triangle? Most of these questions are from the Golden Triangle. Yeah, you bet. So as far as control goes, you got to keep residue on your field, mm -hmm. and that can be handled through crop rotation. Nope. Um, you got to disturb less, so that can be handled with no-till and then cutting a lot higher. Mm -hmm. um, and then also decreasing your field size. And I don't, I don't want people to think that I'm saying we have to go back to 20 strips per section, but certainly if we had two or four fields per section, that would be a lot better with alternating high and residue low residue crops. That's a lot better than having one large section. So all those things, um, no-till, strip cropping, and it doesn't, again, it doesn't have to be narrow strips, um, and then uh, crop rotation, and then harvest management. All those things are NRCS conservation practices, mm -hmm. meaning that we have a standard and specification and job sheet. If a producer comes in and is interested in that, that um, we could get them signed up for that. Um, however, in Montana, our EQIP funding is based on local working group priorities. Could you explain what EQIP is for people who might not be familiar with EQIP? Yeah, that's kind of our flagship program where um, we are essentially helping farmers to implement conservation um, with offsetting with some financial assistance. Um, and how the Montana-focused conservation works is that the local working group gets together, and that's usually the conservation district and other interested members in the community, and they set the top priorities for the, the county or the conservation district. Um, and then from there, um, we will allocate equip funding. So for some counties, they have decided that, for example, spraying noxious weeds on rangeland is their top priority. Um, other counties have decided that you know, solving wind erosion in cropland is their top priority. And so that's where their EQIP funding is going. So I don't want to imply that every county has funding for this. However, I'd really like, currently, maybe I should say currently, I would like to encourage folks who believe this to be an issue to get involved with your local working group 
And then you can help set that priority for the next round of EQIP funding. And if there are other uh, producers in the same county who, who also have this concern, that can set the priority for the funding that is received in your county. I noticed there was no, uh, are windbreaks no longer a thing anymore? They are a thing. A lot of people have taken them out, but that would be another type of practice that we also have. We have a whole suite of practices, like you can even put in grass strips, um, you know, other things that, that can be used. But those were just kind of the top ones that I listed off that sure. were probably people would be more likely to adopt. Sure. Crop rotation being the first one, because that's something you don't have to go buy new equipment. Um, you don't have to reconfigure your field necessarily, but I think a lot could be done in this regard if we looked at our crop rotations. Certainly windbreaks are a great idea though. Yeah. And unfortunately with the increase in field size, we've had you know, larger equipment and it makes it difficult and they've get, got taken out that way. I think we'll, we're not far from seeing programs that will encourage them again for all the positive parts to those those wind breaks, um, wind erosion being one of them. But another biggie is it's one of the best ways to infuse carbon back into the soil, into the system. Because yeah. you put woody material in into these wind breaks and that makes a big difference. Okay. And so if we start paying people for, for capturing carbon, that'd be a great way to do it. Sure. You do notice when you cross the border north of Opime, Whitewater, and you go into southern Alberta and Saskatchewan, you see a lot more windbreaks on that mm -hmm. side of the border than you do on the, on the mm -hmm. U.S. side of the border, interestingly enough. And I yeah. believe for folks who are interested, um, our state forester, Seeley Meyer, was on a couple months ago, mm -hmm. and I, th I think she talked about shelter belts and windbreaks mm -hmm. yep. when she was on. Yep. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of where our forestry practices and our agronomy practices overlap. Thanks. Stephen, we have a caller. They want to know how they can prevent vole damage this year. What should they do to prep for winter? Okay, so I'm assuming it's a residential lawn area, so you want to control now. So that would be look at your property and remove, you want to make sure your tall grass is reduced. So that would be nothing taller than four inches. And I would do either trapping or rodenticides now, so you can look at your residential labeled products. These are things that are usually used for house mice and rats. If you look at the label, a lot of them will have voles on it. You can put your bait stations within 100 feet of your house or a structure and control voles now before the winter, and then you don't have the grass damage over the winter for next spring. I have a publication on voles, and I'll have more information uh, there as well from our website, Montana Department of Ag. Great. Okay, we have a couple other questions that are coming in here. So we have a caller from Helena, <clears throat> has an infestation of thousands of small translucent bug-like creatures. What are they? <laughs> the internet suggested they might be white ash flies, ash white, ash white flies. <laughs> they careful, so, careful Tim. Yep, they sort of, <laughs> Perry Miller actually, he, we can ask him. Um, they, ha, they sort of look like a flying aphid, and I think I did see these recently, and they came out after the dew was over, and they were there for a couple hours, and then the humidity dropped and they disappeared. This was in Kalispell. So, with a description like that, it's difficult to kind of narrow it down. Um, there are a few um, critters that I'm thinking of in my head that could, that resemble <laughs> translucent-like bugs that are whitish, um, that there are tons of, but um, white flies are an example of those. Their aphids have wings, so the wing generation of aphids, they could be flying aphids. Mm -hmm. But um, if, um, I'm hoping that they um, might have a couple if they saw them, if they collected them, um, it would be good to get a sample um, to, to take a look. So if they could send a sample to their county extension office um, or uh, if they have pictures of this, if they could send them to me, I could narrow down exactly what it is. And you can submit photos to the Scudder exactly. Diagnostic Lab um, at MSU mm -hmm. and you, we can identify those for you. Absolutely. Take a, practice your macro shots. Yes, yeah, absolutely. It's always kind of tough sometimes. Um, okay, we have a caller, another caller from Anaconda. 
who transplanted a wild, wild raspberry from the forest five years ago. It grew a little fruit earlier this summer, went dormant, and is now starting to grow small berries in the late season. Mm -hmm. Any idea why the plant has developed fruit, fruit so late? Ah, uh, it's hard to say. Um, I mean, if you have kind of a delayed season, so my raspberries produced later this year than they did last year, um, and they kind of had a delayed start this spring too, but part of it was because the deer did a really good job of pruning my entire raspberry patch. Um, so um, they, the, the little uh, flora canes that, that popped up, there were just a few of those left and they produced a little later uh, in the year. Um, but sometimes when plants are stressed or if there are nutrient issues, there can be delays in fruiting and flowering and things like that. So it's possible. Um, a few things to kind of keep in mind if they've had problems with this in the past. Um, uh, Contact your county extension agent to see um, if you can maybe send a sample of that plant or um, consider if they haven't had a soil test to kind of look into the fertility of the soil, if there are fertility issues that can also cause um, uh, delays. Yeah, I wonder how much a wild raspberry out of the forest would actually respond exactly. to fertility too. I think it would That's be, true. they're kind of keyed in to being mm -hmm. long-term survivors mm -hmm. and they may not want to make a lot of fruit, they may just want exactly. to make it till the next season. Yeah, it's always tough with some of our wi the wild relatives. Mm -hmm. um, so we see we have a search through here. Make sure we go back and get all of these. We have a caller from Missoula who would like to know if this is a good time of year to transplant rhubarb. Yeah, um, you can transplant rhubarb now. This uh, rhubarb is is really great. Um, spring is my favorite time to transplant rhubarb because by then I'm itching to do something in the garden after a long winter. But you can definitely transplant rhubarb now as well. Um, rhubarb is a pretty forgiving plant here in Montana, and so yeah, you can definitely do that now. So when you want to cut a piece off, how big a piece do you need? Yeah, so you want like three um, nodes usually of that, and you want to make sure you get into that root system and get a, a good chunk of that, but you want kind of three buds in there um, per kind of uh, section that you section it off. Good question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, Stephen, we've been talking a little bit about climate change. Things are getting a little warmer and drier, mm -hmm. and I'm going to put you on the spot. Yeah. Do ground squirrels become more active earlier in the spring or stay active later when we have a later spring or, an, or a later fall? Do they stay more active, or what cues them to go into hibernation? Yeah, so great question. I wish I knew the answer to that. So it certainly makes sense that... If, it's, if it warms up sooner, they'll come out of hibernation sooner. Mm -hmm. And if it stays warmer longer, they may, take, they may delay. But I've heard stories, uh, reports from people who've seen ground squirrels come out in December. Mm -hmm. So they'll be going into hibernation and then maybe we'll have a warm spell and they're popping up through the, through the snow or through the, uh, on, or th from the ground. So I don't have good data on that. So I would just say is animals always break the rules. So when we talk about what animals do normally, we just talk about what the normal group does. There's always those outliers in situations can be, can be different. But it would certainly make sense that it would be a little longer. But I think once they hit enough fat where they think they're fat enough to make it through the winter, I think they're kind of going down. And also cooler temperatures will probably trigger that as well. Okay, thanks. Um, <clears throat> Susan, we have another, we have one more question, and they're asking about, um, they have a field that's pretty undulating and rolling, and they mm -hmm. have some knobs and hilltops on there. And they always thought that they had, that was water erosion bringing it down, but is that, they, they wanted to know, is it wind, water erosion? What happens to our hilltops and tops of our hills to the soil there, and how does that, how does that affect crop production, and what, other than tall stubble, what could they maybe do to, to think about um, managing those areas? Yeah, great question. So um, the top of a, a knoll, especially on the windward side, um, mm -hmm. gets more erosion than any other part of the field. And that's because the wind pressure or the wind, the wind becomes compressed as it moves over the top of that. And so there's just more energy that's driving across that. So here in the Gallatin Valley, we have a lot of undulating hills and you'll see there's a lot of, um, the soil is lighter 
on the tops of those hills, or sometimes even white, mm -hmm. and that's why, because those knolls have been eroded more than the rest of the field. Um, so obviously residue and vegetation, you know, maybe um, in some situations like that on very hilly ground, or on ground that is very sandy, because sandier soils are more uh, prone to wind erosion. Sometimes if you've tried everything that you can and it's still an issue, you might want to consider just permanent vegetation. Mm -hmm. So putting it into perennial vegetation, putting grass in, something yeah, like that. Yeah, it's not always possible, but for some people it can't be a, a solution. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks. Let's see what we else we have on the... So we have another question for Bruce. And, well, this came in. We can all answer it. This is for the Bozeman area. Has this summer been wetter than normal? Uh, yes, it's been wetter than normal, normal being the, the last 30 year average. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not the wettest. It was about the fourth wettest, I think. Mm -hmm. This month, you mean, did you say? Uh, no, they were asking about the summer in general. Oh, summer in general. If you take the, actually the three month period, it, I don't think Bozeman was as, as wet. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I think it was, uh, I think we've had plenty of other, other years where it was wetter. Yep. But it sure seemed like that because we've got, most recent years have been uh, uh, much more dry yep. in, in our summer. So I think we got used to that. And so it seemed like quite, quite a wet summer. But yeah, if you take the June, July, August period as the, as the summer, then uh, um, it's not as, as uh, different as you would think. I think it was above that average, though, for the last 30 years. For yep. sure. but it wasn't like that across most of the state. And, you know, I always view, my, my judge on a wet summer is, did the C4 grasses grow in the Gallatin Valley? <laughs> and the C4 grasses are the warm season grasses, corn being one of them, mm -hmm. millet, sorghum Sudan. Mm -hmm. And usually we try to be fancy in our experimentation sometimes, and we try to follow something with the warm season grass. And usually it's too hot and dry to ever get them to germinate. And that's the reason why our native rangelands are mostly C3 grasses. And so whenever I see a C4 grass, I chalk, and it grows in dry land situations in Montana, I'll call that a wet summer. <laughs> that's <laughs> my judge for, and so Perry Miller's sweet corn down at the post farm actually right now looks really pretty good. And he actually has sorghum that's growing tall enough to harvest as well. So those are two kind of new crops we don't think about, but when you have, we have warmer summers and you can actually put water to it, we can grow corn in, in some situations. That's true with some broadleaf species as well, the weeds. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, well, you'll, you'll see a shift towards pigweed, a C4 species, mm -hmm. in the hotter, drier, early summers. Yep. Versus, you know, in a wetter, cooler, it'll be lamb's quarter. Yep. Even in the same place. It's amazing how those two species co-occur, but can be their dominant switches given the different kind of years. Yep, and I'm glad you came back to um, pigweeds. Because on the show, I've talked multiple times about Palmer amaranth. And actually, for the first time, we found Palmer amaranth growing in a crop field just recently mm -hmm. in Daniels County. It came in via contaminated millet seed, and that's the biggest vector into the state. But that's a pigweed, but it's one of these dioecious pigweeds that's evolved herbicide resistance to many, many, many modes of action of herbicides. You go down and you talk about species, that us, these genotypes that are six, seven way resistant to herbicides. So we run out of options. So we're really on the early detection rapid response of, of in Montana now, trying to make sure they don't establish. But when we went to the pigweeds, they actually hadn't made seed yet. They were just now flowering in late August. So you see them flowering in that warm season crops. So if you guys are out there, go look for your millet seeds and make sure you, uh, or go look in your millet fields and make sure you don't have any Palmer amaranth in there. And if you do, contact your county agent and it'll make its way to the Scudder Diagnostic Lab. The other incidents of Palmer amaranth found in the state actually came from contaminated bird feed. And someone, <clears throat> put a photo, a very smart person in Shelby put the photo up on iNaturalist. iNaturalist is a web page and they put it up and they wanted, they suggested the ID was Palmer Amaranth and we backed it up and we, that was the first instance. It was one lonely male plant in Shelby 
throwing in someone's right next to their bird feeder. Wow. Mm, wow. Yeah, so that, wow. Was the, that was the second incidence of it. So quickly, in the last time that we have left, Abby, I brought this lovely zucchini leaf yeah. out of my garden. And it's what a lot of the plants look like in the Gallatin Valley right now, so maybe yeah. you could tell us about it. Yeah, so I'm glad that your garden is an experiment <laughs> for lots of samples for us, but this is um, powdery mildew. Um, and uh, it's a pretty common issue, especially as we were talking about the cool, wet, kind of season that we're seeing right now. Um, this is a host specific um, fungus, so the one that's gonna affect your zucchini is not the same one that's going to be affecting your lilacs and, and so on and so forth. But a lot of times these this fungus thrives in the high moisture environment, so making sure that you are reducing overhead irrigation, thinning out plants that might be overcrowded to increase circulation can help kind of reduce this issue. You can also plant resistant varieties um, and yeah, that's a good, a good way to reduce the problem. Great. Yep. So my, yeah, my zucchini, that's good to know. I have it on my lilacs and zucchinis too. And, and so it's two ones. different species. Yes. Great. So thank you everyone for joining us tonight on Montana Ag Live. If we did not get to your question tonight, we will be happy to answer that question next week and fill in those questions this week on Facebook, send them in and we'll answer them next week. Um, have a good summer week or last fall week and enjoy that. Do some good gardening and thanks again. Good night. For more information and resources, visit montanapbs.org slash ag live. Montana Ag Live is made possible by the Montana Department of Agriculture, MSU Extension, the MSU Ag Experiment Stations of the College of Agriculture, the Montana Wheat and Barley Committee, Cashman Nursery and Landscaping, the Northern Pulse Growers Association, and the Gallatin Gardeners Club.